Okay. All right, Martin Buber, this is our next philosopher. Let me write his name down. Here are the dates, 1878 to 1965. Uh, so I'll tell you a little bit about his biography. So one, bio, and number two, we'll talk about Ayan Dao, which is the book that we're gonna be studying together. Okay, so he was born in Vienna. This is in Austria to an um, Orthodox Jewish family. He actually, uh, his family was very religious. In fact, his grandfather was very well known for being a, a, a Jewish study scholar, very well known scholar who um, was teaching and also had a lot of you know, people coming over to talk and discuss. And Buber actually grew up with his grandfather. So he actually spent a lot of time in that house, right, surrounded by books and discussions. So he grew up pretty much completely immersed in Judaism. But when he turned 13, 14, he started to feel um, uncomfortable with Judaism. And he kind of left it uh, for a while and turned to philosophy. So he started to read some of the people we've read, right? He started to read Kant. Let me write this down. He read Kierkegaard. And actually, you'll see connections. Um, he also read uh, Nietzsche, right? But we, we haven't studied him, so it's a little irrelevant. <laughs> but you're going to see a lot of connections between Buber and Kant, right? This idea of respect that Kant talks about, about not treating people like means, but as ends. You're going to see the similar language in Buber, except Buber will go even a little deeper. But the starting point of Buber is definitely Kant. So, so he starts to read those guys, and then he has a conversion back into Judaism uh, through uh, by being introduced to a movement in Judaism that was at the time very popular called Hasidism. So let's talk a little bit about this movement because this will give you a very good insight into Buber's mindset, uh, the way that he thinks, and so forth. So, so Hasidism was a, it's a revival of Judaism that took place in Eastern Europe. These were a bunch of rabbis who started to kind of rebel against the traditional Judaism. They wanted um, to go back to some of the elements that they felt had been forgotten by the religion. Very similar, by the way, remember we studied Rumi and we talked about Sufism and the way that the Sufis were uh, in a way uh, confronting traditional Islam and saying we have forgotten, you know, we have forgotten that it's the heart that matters, not so much the keeping of the law, right? We need to have the proper feelings of love and this is really what matters, the internal, not just the external. Similar ideas in the movement of Hasidism. So Hasidism is to Judaism what Sufism is to Islam. <laughs> okay, let me write it down. <laughs> what Sufism is to Islam. Okay, so this is really a very similar trend, very similar criticism. Um, so there were two main criticisms that Hasidism addressed to Judaism. Number one, the, the overemphasis, similar to Sufism, on the law, right? And the forgetting, right? of the heart. So there was an overemphasis on external behavior and as they were doing on, you know, you keep the law the right way, you have to do this, look like this, but they were forgetting, they believe the inner state, the emotional component of religion, right? And so the Hasidim actually, so when I say Hasidim, it's the people who belong to Hasidism, right? Hasidim. This is, uh, so let me write this right. Hasidim are uh, the rabbis, right? That um, invented Hasidism, I guess. I can put it like that, right? So the Hasidim actually were turning back to the religion of the heart. And they were saying what matters really is not so much your outside behavior, but how you feel inside. Are you joyful? Are you loving? If you are, then you have a connection. No matter what you're doing on the outside, what matters is the inner state, right? So there's a story that the Hasidim tell to illustrate this, how the, what matters is the heart and not so much the outward behavior, right? The sign that you're in touch with God is your joy, your love, your peace. If you have these, you're there. You don't need anything else, right? So here's a story to tell. So there is this rabbi um, who actually became best friends with, how shall I put it? 
um, the biggest gangster of the city. Okay, so there's this rabbi and he's best friends with the biggest gangster of the city. And they're hanging out and they love each other's company. They go and get beers together and they're always, you know, laughing at each other's jokes. And one day the disciples of the rabbi are like, why are you hanging out with this sinner? Like how you, one of the most respected rabbis, are spending so much time with this immense sinner, right? And the rabbi is like, I know, I know, I know. But he said, I love this guy because he's so happy. He's so happy all the time. I love this guy. I can't get enough of him. Um, I feel like he's teaching me something, right? So if you were to analyze the story, what, what is the rabbi actually saying, right? He's saying, well, this guy actually, even though you see him as a sinner, I see him as even more connected to God than I am, who is always kind of, you know, melancholic and depressed. And I see him as a guide, right? So this is kind of the meaning of the story that this particular gangster, even though he was committing all of these crimes, because he was always joyful and upbeat, actually shows that he had perhaps a deeper connection to God than even the rabbi spending days studying the Bible, but feeling slightly melancholic and depressed, right? So this is just to tell you the spirit of Hasidism, very open, very um, subversive, right? What really matters is the heart, not so much the outside behavior. There's another story, I mean, another aspect that they criticized was the isolation of Judaism versus integration, right? So there's this, I, there is this criticism in Hasidism that uh, against traditional Judaism, that Judaism had become increasingly isolated. They were not so much blending with the world anymore. They were in their own villages, in their own communities. And, um, and there are historical reasons for that, right? Um, we know that at the time in Europe, there was a lot of anti-Semitism, and so the Jews kind of retracted together, became more isolated. But what the Hasidim are saying is that, well, when we're doing this, we are in a way keeping our light to ourselves. We are not uh, infusing the world with our light. And so they emphasize that as Jews, you have to enter the world, be part of the world, share your light with the world rather than retract in a communal separate community so they actually were so adamant about this that they said you know there is no more difference between the sacred and the secular because the secular itself can become sacred in other words everything that you do if you do it with your whole heart is actually a sacred task right so again the emphasis on the heart right so it's not what you do it's how you do it that matters right and so there was the idea that even if you were you know um you know a construction worker right it's not very spiritual but if you do it with all your heart and your soul <laughs> and your body then it is as though you are offering the greatest sacrifices in the most beautiful temple right if your heart is fully involved it is the most profound act of worship the most beautiful prayer that you have ever done right so the idea that it's not what you do that makes you that brings you close to god is how you do it right so you have to see a little bit how this would be attractive to boober right this idea of emphasizing the heart not so much the external but the emotional quality of the heart. Okay, so we'll see some of this in his writing when he talks about relationships, right? <clears throat> We're going to see some of these ideas in his understanding of relationships, and we'll come to that in a second. So continuing with his biography. Um, so he ends up studying philosophy. Uh, he begins teaching. Uh, but he moves to Germany, so he's teaching in Germany uh, in 1930. This is when he gets his position. But then in 1933, what happens in Germany that is devastating to his career? <laughs> Anybody remember? <laughs> yes, the Nazis come to power. And of course, he's a Jewish professor and he's kindly asked to step down, right? This was the, <laughs> this was the, the policy, right? If you were a Jewish professor, you were not allowed to lecture anymore. So he you know, he, he, he actually, um, he's forbidden to lecture. So he's very smartly understand the climate 
understands the climate of the times and, and four years later moves to Jerusalem, 1938, before, you know, really things got very bad in Germany. And he stays in Jerusalem from then on, right? So, so, um, so Buber will really be writing, so going now into his thought, his writing on relationships is not going to be just about, you know, love and like we're doing in the class. He's thinking about relationships with the background of the Nazis, of the communists. He's looking at how uh, the world is evolving. And that's against that backdrop, he's writing the book, I and Thou. So let's talk a little bit about the world that Buber is evolving in, the political context, so we can see more clearly what he's going to be trying to do in I and Thou. The political context around Buber in the 30s, in the 40s, can be qualified by the rise of totalitarianism, right? You have more and more fascistic regimes where people are asked in a way to just um, merge with the ideology of the regime. Don't debate, don't think differently. You need to align yourself with the ideology. And if you think differently, we will either kill you or exile you. This was the climate of the times, right? You see this in the USSR, you see this in Italy uh, with fascism, you see this in Germany. And of course, eventually Nazism spreads throughout Europe. So you have this general climate of people are there just to work for the ideology and that's their goal. If you think anything else, you're not, we will expulse you or we will kill you. If you think differently, if you feel differently, if you look differently, right? This is what happened during Nazism. If you don't fit into our ideal citizen, <laughs> we will destroy you and exterminate you, right? So he's noticing how little by little human beings are losing or we are losing the sense of the sacredness of human beings. This is in essence what Buber is observing, right? Let me write it down. We are losing little by little the sense of the sacredness of human beings. The sense that there is something there that we cannot use, manipulate, discard. Remember Kant, right? He's thinking like Kant, right? Kant was saying human beings are a sacred dimension. We can't use. They're not like objects, like the lipstick or like the pen. I can't use them. I can't manipulate them. I can't throw them away, destroy them when I feel like it, right? And so what Buber is noticing is that this sense of respect for the dignity of human beings, we are losing this slowly, right? And there are many ways that he's noticing this trend, right? I'm going to write a few down. We have the issue of war, right? It becomes very easy to declare war at the time of Buber, right? We see that with Hitler. And it becomes very easy to draft thousands and hundreds of thousands of young men to die in this war, right? For the sake of the ideology, losing, right? The sacredness of human life, this, this increase of violence in the European continent, right? We kill the other side and we allow our own to be killed without a second thought, right? We are just throwing them on the battlefield <laughs> as though they were disposable right? So he's noticing that. Second thing he's noticing, exploitation of the workers, right? More and more, right? He's noticing how companies are exploiting their workers for profit. So the workers are just means to an end. We use them and then we throw them away when they don't function, right? Then we get a new one, replaceable, just like an object, right? So he's noticing that trend, right? Uh, and of course, he's noticing even in our personal lives, right? more and more people are just you know means to an end i hang out with you because you bring me this i discard you because you don't serve me right remember the relationship doesn't serve me anymore and so now <laughs> i discard that person right so today today by the way we're still there we're still a very highly militarized nation for us war is a normal part of life <laughs> In fact, to get an education seems like you have to go to war in this country. 
right? We have massive exploitation of workers and in our even private lives, right? More and more, even with the arrival of technology, right? We have people that we ghost or we unfriend them or we get rid of them when we are done with them, or, <laughs> right? So he's noticing this, right? Globally, we are suffering from um, this um, increasing loss of the sacredness of the human dimension. We exploit, we kill, we use, we discard without a second thought, right? It's natural, it's become natural. So make sure you write this down, right? That what Buber is witnessing and what he's responding to in I and Thou in the book that we're gonna read is this gradual loss of the sense of the sacredness of the human being, right? Let me write it down in the chat, loss uh, we, we lose the sense or awareness of the sacredness of human beings, right? We lose the sense of the dignity of human beings. We kill, we exploit, we use, we discard, right? That's how we do in things, perfectly naturally, like we breathe. <laughs> right and so he's saying we're losing something right and we have to in a way learn again how to relate to each other as human beings and not as objects that i can just use and discard right so that's the goal of i and thou right the book i and thou is there to teach us again how to relate to another human being as a human being and not just as an object and so you'll hear a lot of Kant, but you're going to hear more also he has a little more to say so just a few words on the concepts you will meet in the book. You have the concept I, it, you'll have the concept I, I, and the concept I, thou, or I, you, depending on your translation, right? Thou and you is interchangeable in Hoover. Okay, so I, it is simply, it's, these three concepts are ways of that we relate to the world. There are ways that we relate to the outside world. So when you're relating to the world as an I, it, can anyone guess? What is the world to you when you're relating or what are people to you when you're relating to them in an I, it fashion? Can anyone guess what that means? You're seeing someone as an it, what does it mean? Very good, Hassan, right? You're objectifying them, they're an object that you can use and discard. That's the I, it relationship. When you relate to a human being as an it, you are in an I, it relationship with them. So the I, it is simply relating to someone as an it. Um, very good. So what would the I, thou relationship look like? That one should be easy now. How are you relating to somebody when you're relating to them as a thou or as a you? Same thing, I, you. How are you seeing them? How are you treating them? You can put in the chat. I would say that you're kind of, you're kind of honoring that Kantian understanding of someone being like, you know, that, that idea of respect and then being them, themselves as opposed to like a means. Yeah, absolutely. Right. When you relate to someone as a you, you number one, don't see them as an it. Now we're going to learn with Buber what it means to see someone as a you. He has a lot to say. But we already know from Kant, right, that to see someone as a you, that means to see them as a human being, as a person, as a, you know, as somebody, we already, right, as a human being, we know already from Kant and Buber agrees that we're not going to use and discard. So that's the IU. When you relate to someone in an IU way, you're, re you're seeing them as a you. You're seeing them as person and therefore treating them differently than an object. Now, here's a tricky one. What would I, I way of relating to the world mean? This is a little trickier. Let's see if any one of you can get it. You'll see this concept also in Boober. Very good, Evans, right? It is basically seeing yourself in the world. You don't even see another person. Everyone is just a reflection of you, right? You're completely alone and everything is just how you feel, what you want. There's not even an it there, right? Yeah, very good, Blade. Solipsism. So this is a kind of way of acting in the world that is so self-centered that you don't even see that there is others around you. Everything is just there for your enjoyment and pleasure. 
there is not even an object. <laughs> Everything is the same, right? So this is the ultimate. We'll see how that works, right? The I, I is really a way of seeing everything, a way of not even seeing, right? You don't even see. In the I, I, there is only you, right? And your pleasure and sensations, right? There's not even a world. <laughs> So we'll talk about this, right? So, so, but the main concepts you need to remember for next time's reading is the I, it, and the I, you. Those are the ones we'll be focusing on, right? And so we are going to discover, so that's the goal of the book, right? What does it mean to relate to someone as a human being? How can we remember, right? The ancient art of relating to a human being as some, something sacred. What does it entail? That's what we're going to learn, right, in Buber. Okay, any questions on anything I said? Okay, so just a few words on how to read Buber because his style is going to be interesting. So what did we read? We read Kierkegaard. Okay, so far when we read, we had like nice chapters and you know, everything kind of, you know, there was a nice argument. With Buber, we're entering a completely different reality. The way he writes is fragments. So you have one idea here and then he moves another idea here and it's like little paragraphs, little fragments. There's a reason why he writes like this, right? Remember that with, with Buber, we are between the two world wars, right? We are in a time in Europe where in a way truth has been shattered, right? We thought we knew who we were as Europeans. We thought we knew where we were going during the enlightenment, during modernity, when we were thinking, yeah, reason is gonna solve all the problems, we're getting there. So we thought we knew each other. We thought we knew who we were as human beings. Turns out with the wars, with such massive cruelty and bloodshed, we realize, well, maybe we don't know ourselves so well. Maybe we're not headed where we thought we were headed. Maybe we don't know where we're going. Maybe we're confused. Maybe we don't even know who we are. In a world like this, right, where there's no more clarity and it's all confused, it's like truth has been shattered. You can only go and gather a few fragments here and there glimpses of truth and that's what Buber is doing right he realizes nobody can go around saying they know anymore because clearly we didn't know we didn't see this coming this these two world wars this genocide never would we have predicted that we could take that direction right and so now in the aftermath of the wars or between the two world wars all we can do is pick up the pieces right a brick here a <laughs> little bit of wood here and then try to you know bring these glimpses together and that's kind of what Hooper is doing intellectually everything has been destroyed philosophy theology everything has been destroyed and so all you can do between the wars is pick up the fragments here is a tiny piece of truth here is another piece of truth here is another little window or glimpse into the truth and that is really why he writes the way he does right he's not going to be self-assured right kind of like Kierkegaard who's pretty confident when he's writing or Kant right he's going to be much more humble much more tentative hesitant here's a little bit of what I understood here's something else and now you put it together right so it's actually easier to read right because you don't have to follow you can just but it's also harder because he is writing in a way that's very obscure you don't know it's very poetic. And so you don't know right away what he means. It's intriguing. Um, he writes kind of like Rumi, right? He has a lot of images and metaphors. And you don't right away see what he's saying. You have to actually stop and ponder a little bit and reflect on what he's saying. Uh, and, it, and it's okay because you just have a fragment to read. So <laughs> you can stop on your fragment and then go to the next fragment. So it's actually not too hard to read, although it is still stimulating and challenging because you don't get it right away. Um, but don't worry, we will get it together in class. <laughs> okay, so any questions? All right, good. I'm gonna stop the recording.